Because without you, we have nothing. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Our strength and our redeemer. Lord, I come thanking you this morning for allowing my baby girl, Essence, to see her 28th birthday. Our daughter, who I am well pleased. Watch over and keep her, Lord. Lord, we bless every family at the Mountain Church. You know what we stand in the need of. Grant us, bless us, keep us in your care. We love you today. We bless your name. And we praise your name. Because you're so worthy to be praised. Amen.
we are excited about what God is doing right here and right now, and that we have the opportunity to hear from the angel of this house. Would you receive with me none other than our pastor, Dr. S. J. Gilbert? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Mold me, melt me, break me, and fill me now with the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you that my mind is alert, that my lips are anointed. Open my mouth that I may preach the mysteries of your gospel. Forgive me of every sin and cleanse me of every unrighteousness. And Lord, I ask that you would hide me now behind the deepest, darkest, and most obscure portion of your cross. These your people will hear absolutely none of me, but hear absolutely all of thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We thank these men for ministering to us today, a portion of our men's group, and we are blessed by their music worship today. i like to call your attention to Psalm 78, verses 17 through 20. Psalm 78, 17 through 20. But they continued to sin against him, rebelling in the wilderness against the Most High. They willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God. They said, can God really spread a table in the wilderness? True, he struck the rock and water gushed out. Streams flowed abundantly. But can he also give us bread? I'd like to talk just a few minutes from the subject a wonder in the wilderness. A wonder in the wilderness. All believers in the Lord share a common experience. Those who come before us, those who are now walking with us, and those who are to come after us must all go through a wilderness experience. And when you look and read that list of faith hall of famers recorded in the Hebrew by the Hebrew writer, you will discover they all had to go through the wilderness or they spent some time in the wilderness. Names like Abraham and Jacob and Moses and David and Elijah even Jesus was there. Their examples are meant to guide us as we also pass through the wilderness. By wilderness, I'm referring to the times of God's tests and trials in our lives. You've, you've heard it said on many occasions that a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. Yeah. No one plans to go on vacation in the wilderness. No one wants to spend time in the desert. The wilderness is a fearful place to be. Nothing but barren hills, deep valleys, hot sun and dirt that seem to go on forever. A man without supplies wouldn't last long in the wilderness. A million plus people wandering around would soon starve to death in the wilderness. There isn't enough water, there isn't enough food. The sun beats down mercilessly during the day and at night the desert grows dark, cold, and dangerous. Few people can survive there for too long. So why did God make wilderness places anyway? Certainly without him it would be difficult for us to appreciate green trees, green pastures. 
So God also knew that the wilderness is an ideal place to test his people and to help them learn faith and endurance. So in Hebrew, the word for wilderness is mitbar. It is interesting that the root word of mitbar has the meaning of speak, a word. In other words, God speaks to us in the wilderness. Hallelujah. Yeah. The wilderness period is a period where, where God has opportunity to speak to us. Well, some folk God been trying to speak to you for a while. But you're always so busy and in a hurry. Didn't have time. But now that you are in the wilderness, God has time. You have time to hear from God. Some people were too prideful too arrogant to come to church and worship God. But the wilderness has humbled you and now you can hardly wait for the church doors to reopen. And since the wilderness is a common experience of our faith, we need to learn about it, especially the rules of spiritual survival. We might ask the question, when are we most likely to experience the wilderness? Strangely, these experiences often come on the heels of great spiritual breakthroughs. In other words, when God has blessed you or used you in a marvelous and powerful way. After every mountaintop experience, there are usually a valley that's waiting below. Now there are many examples of men and women of faith who had to endure through a wilderness experience after a great spiritual victory. Elijah had just defeated the prophets of Baal on that great battle at Mount Carmel. When God sent down fire to consume that burnt offering in just a few days, he was on the rock in the wilderness, fleeing from that wicked woman named Jezebel. Yeah. David, after his great victory over the lion, spent many years in caves and hideouts and in the wilderness. Much of the book of Psalm was written because of his suffering. John the Baptist was referred to as a voice crying and calling in the wilderness. And then there was Jesus many centuries later after he was baptized and after he heard the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son of whom I am well pleased was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil 40 days and 40 nights. And when we look back over Israel's history, it seems that so many of her blessings came from the wilderness. Such was the case in our text. The children of Israel were just miraculously delivered through the Red Sea and they escaped from Pharaoh and Egypt. They had also just received the Torah law and had experienced the very presence of the living God in smoke and fire. And very soon after their mountaintop experience, they had to wander in the wilderness. That wilderness time is like being between trapezes. Between trapezes is a metaphor to describe the frightening moment when you leave the familiar for the unfamiliar. Yeah. One writer described it this way, it's not so much 
that we're afraid of change or so in love with old ways, but it's that place in between that we fear. It's like being in between trapezes. It's lighter when his blanket is in the dryer. There's nothing to hold on to. But having left Egypt, they discovered that the wilderness was a tough place to live. They were between trapezes in that frightening place where you let go of the past, but the future has not yet arrived. Uh, uh, in that desperate place between trapezes, it's easy to doubt that God knows what you're going through. The psalmist informs us that the people who had trusted in God to get them out of Egypt spoke against him openly. It wasn't the first time. If you followed the Jews ever since the great miracle at the Red Sea, you would have heard them moaning and groaning and gripping and complaining. Ah, uh, ah, uh, who is Moses anyway? Why did God put him in charge? We miss Egypt. At least we had food to eat. It's hot out here. We're tired of wandering in circles. Why are we here? Let me just share with someone. In order to make it to your promise, man, you've got to leave Egypt. It would have been easier for the Jews if upon crossing the Red Sea they had stepped directly into Canaan, the land of promise. But that's not how God usually works. We all must go through some wilderness time to get from where we were to where God wants us to be. Therefore, with the help of the psalm, I thought I would share with you a few characteristics of the wilderness to help you endure your own wilderness experience. And the only road that leads to heaven runs through the wilderness. There are no detours or alternate routes. No one can get close to Jesus without going through the wilderness with him. I heard someone say, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there is a cross for everyone. And there's a cross for me. The consecrated cross I bear to death shall set me free and then go home my crown to wear for there's a crown for me. Someone said, no cross, no crown. Yeah. And so I've come this morning to say, no wilderness, no wonders. However, if you want to see some wonders in the wilderness, some deliverance in the desert, some delights in dark places, there are three things you need to know about the wilderness. And first of all, it is that the wilderness is a solitary place. A solitary place. The wilderness is a lonely place. It's a huge, vast, trackless expanse of desert that seemed to go on forever. Walk for a mile in any direction, and the terrain looks the same. Climb over a hill, and all of you see, all you see is more of the same. Even though you may be surrounded by people in the wilderness, you can feel alone. You can feel abandoned. You can feel forgotten. You can feel discarded. And we've all been there. Yeah. Waiting for the job interview. Hoping for good news from the doctor. Watching money run out. Worrying about our children. Wondering if we can hold on for another week. Trying to rebuild our shot of dreams. Feeling stuck in the mud. And wondering if life will ever change. In those lonely tense moments. It's easy to think. That God has forgotten me. But it is much more the other way around. We're the ones who have forgotten God. Hallelujah. We're the ones that have drifted away from God. We're the ones who have forsaken God. The psalmist said, but they continue to sin against him. Rebelling in the wilderness against the Most High. They willfully put God to the test by 
the murdering of food they craved. They spoke against God. They said, can God really spread a table in the wilderness? Occasionally, God must get us to a solitary place. Isolated, desolated place so he can bring us back into remembrance of who he is and what he's done in our lives. And even though the wilderness is a solitary place, a lonely place, but if God, hallelujah, is there, it can be a place that you can draw closer to God. Oh, oh, for in that solitary place, you're reminded that God is really all you have. Yeah. But then the fact is, he's really all you need. Have you ever noticed that when you go into a surgery, your spouse, your children, your friends, your church members, they can't go into the operating room with you. But that solitary place, the only one who you can take with you is God. Yeah. Huh? In that solitary place. But he's a good person to be with you. When, you, when, you, when you're in that solitary place, you ought to be able to say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If thou would draw thyself from me, where shall I go? All I'm trying to say is, I know we are restricted as to where all we can go right now. Yeah. I know that we can't do all the things right now that we used to could do. I know that we can't even see people we used to could see. But I want you to know, don't despise and dread this solitary place that we find ourselves in right now. Due to COVID-19. I stopped by today to tell you, use it to your advantage to get closer to God and watch Him perform wonders in your life. You might be quarantined, but you're you are quarantined with Jesus. Hallelujah. You, you, you're not, you might not be able to go out and eat at your favorite restaurant. But you can open your Bible and eat on the Word of God. You might not be able to fellowship with the saints, but every day you can walk and talk with Jesus. Uh, so stop worrying about what you can't do, hallelujah, and focus on what you can do. What can you do when I can lift my eyes to the hills from which cometh my help? My help cometh the Lord was made the heaven and the earth. What can you do? I can pray without ceasing. What can you do? I can trust in the Lord with all my heart and lean it not to my own understanding but in all thy ways I'm acknowledging him knowing he will direct our path. That's what I can do in my wilderness solitary place. And secondly, not only is the wilderness a solitary place? But the wilderness is a necessary place. Uh, uh, verse 19 says, Can God set a table in the wilderness? At the table, the family come together to share a meal. At the table, family members share their life together. Come to the table, and there you'll find food and drink fellowship and laughter and encouragement come to the table and then you'll discover that you are not alone come to the table and then you'll find others who know what you're going through come to the table and, and you'll find that you're welcome no matter what you've been through. Psalm 23 
David says of the Lord in verse 5 that you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Yes, Come to the New Testament and there you find the Lord's table yeah. where brothers and sisters come together yes. and meet together around the table of the Lord. Yes, sir. Jesus told the story in Luke 14, 21 about a man hosting a great banquet and many of the seats because some who were invited decided not to come. He told his servants to go out, find anyone, anywhere, uh, who would come to this great feast. No, no seat must be left empty. Go out quickly to the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And when there were still seats left, he sent his servant again. Verse 23 of that chapter 14 chapter say, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house may be full. Hallelujah. If those, if, if those who had been invited first would not come, then the master would go after the outcasts who would never otherwise come to such a fine affair. Well, that's how God does it. He goes after the people the world overlooks because the prideful and arrogant have no interest in coming to him for salvation. Yes, when we come to the Lord's table, all earthly distinctions must be set aside. We come just as we are. Sinners in desperate need of the grace of God. We lay aside the things that separate us, things like titles and status and race and color and language and culture, and we come hungry. Yeah. We come thirsty to the table of the Lord. Yes, All four Gospels record the vast miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus fed the 5,000 in a remote place. The disciples wanted to send the people away because they had no food. But Jesus told them, no, stay here. He would provide the food the disciples would serve. He provided everything necessary for that hungry crowd. God's table. At God's table, the food never runs out. At God's table, no one ever goes away hungry. At God's table, you walk away satisfied. We all know that children love to complain about their food, don't they? They don't like spaghetti. They don't like broccoli. Or they're tired of milk. Or they wouldn't rather, they would rather have some donuts. Why can't we have tacos tonight? You know, many moms have spent hours preparing meals only to have her children ruin it with their unkind comments. So, it was in the wilderness for the people of God when God provided manna and quail so they would not starve. It was not enough. The food of Egypt seemed to be so much better. How boring to eat manna every day. How many ways can you serve quail? I'm not satisfied by their ungratefulness. I, I'm not satisfied. This, this pandemic has reminded me of how much many of us have took for granted. Yes, Being able to go on vacation, go on to the movies, to eat out the restaurant, or celebrate birthdays, or special occasions, things that we'll never take for granted again. We take our blessings for granted. How soon we take what God has done and is doing in our lives so lightly. He led them through the Red Sea. He delivered them from Pharaoh's power. Look at what he's done. He set them free from bondage. Look at what he's done. He protected them from the plagues. Look at what he's done. He led them with a cloud by day and a 
pillow. Look at what all God has done for them. And all they can do is complain that the murder is not enough. It's never enough. When you don't trust God, I'm going to say it again. I say no matter what he does, it's never enough. When you don't trust God. So they complained and said, can God set a table in the wilderness? Can God do wonders in the wilderness? It looked impossible to them. Some of you during this pandemic, perhaps you're asking similar questions. Can God set a table for me in this pandemic? Can God still heal? Can God still provide? Can God still come through? Can God still rescue? Can God still do wonders in the wilderness? Yeah. Don't be so hard on the children of Israel yeah. because many of us are just like them. Yeah. We get in trouble. We cry out. God has forgotten us. We have no idea how much food God has prepared for us. We have no idea how much water is in the river of life. We act like we serve a poor God as if our God cannot afford to help his people. So we say, where's the money? And let that rule everything for us. But in Christ are hid all the riches of heaven. The wilderness is necessary because it shows us both our own weakness and how God can meet us in the most amazing ways. As long as you stay in Egypt, you'll never need manna and quail. But you also won't experience the miracle working power of God either. So I stop by today to tell you, I'd rather be in the wilderness of God so I can know how he's able to take care of me than to be under the ruling hand of Pharaoh uh, and sitting in that slave position. I'd rather be in the wilderness of God than to be in the palaces of Pharaoh. Because I know that if Pharaoh feeds you, then you have to trust Pharaoh. But if God feeds you, you got to trust God. And so I say like Andre Cross, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. Through it all, I've learned to trust in God. I thank God for my mountains. I thank God for my valleys. I thank him for the storms he brought me through. For if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. I never know what faith in God could do. The wilderness is necessary for our journey with God. For through the wilderness, we learn to trust in the Lord. Well, finally, as I head to a close, if you're going to see God perform some wonders in your wilderness, not only must you know that the wilderness is a solitary place, not only must you know that the wilderness is a necessary place, but you need to know that the wilderness is a temporary place. The wilderness uh, is not an easy place to be. It can seem dangerous, lonely and deadly, risky and hopeless. It's easy to get lost there. It's easy to get confused there. It's easy to get discouraged there. You may spend a long time there, but I stopped by today to tell you, it's just temporary. While you're in this temporary place, God is trying to teach you 
some valuable lessons. He wants you to learn your own limitations. I want you to wrestle with your own temptations. I want you to learn to lean on others. I want you to find strength that you didn't know you had. I want you to encounter the impossible. I want you to know what God is really like. Yes. So I stopped by today to tell you and ask you a question. Where is your wilderness? Yes. You know, your wilderness can be your own home. Yes. Your wilderness can be your own family. Yes. Your wilderness can be a difficult work environment. Yes. Your wilderness uh, can be your own boring life. Your wilderness can be a sick child. And your wilderness can be a paralyzing depression. Your wilderness can be the city you hate. And, and, and your wilderness can be the family you rather not see. Or marriage that's slowly dying. But the question you may be asking, can God prepare a place, a table in that place? Can God still perform, hallelujah, wonders in that place? I came to tell somebody, yes he can. Yes, he can. I know he can. He can turn your midnight in the day. He can turn your setback in the setup. He can turn your problems in the praise. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. But you got to remember that the wilderness is just temporary. Oh, <laughs> 